Monday, everybody. Yo. Hey, there we go. Hi, everybody. Yo. Yes. It is. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. She Hulk shorter season. Oh, was did they was, announce? I didn't. I haven't I, read the I, news I, yet. I saw some. I <laughs> had some trailer out. <laughs> but between now and Cord Killers, I will be an expert on whatever it is I just said. But for right now, it's only just a blip on the radar. <laughs> oh, I, what I, that, do you see the trailer at all? Uh, no, 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 no. I've it, heard is, it's is good. It, is it ungood or? I've seen people who like uh, it. If the CGI didn't look like 1990s grade crap, like it looked, uh. there are shots where she's like walking to the camera and you're like, why is her hair? Like it just, Really bad CG uh, for it, some well, of the shots. And, and uh, everything I'm about to say comes from a place of She-Hulk being my favorite comic book for three reasons. And a very uh, simple bit. Uh, the yes, um, the uh, 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 she's smart, uh, she's strong like the Hulk, and also she's self-aware in that Leslie Nielsen naked gun kind of way. Um, I don't know how much of that will persevere, especially because a lot of the smart Hulk thunder got stolen by the second Avengers, you know, Avengers Endgame. Mm. So, so it's like that won't be novel. Uh, and now we live in a uh, an interesting time where people are rethinking uh, 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 sexual identities and and you know, w uh, I... strong versus weak women and so on. Um, and and I I don't I do I. All of this is to say that that I read She-Hulk in a simpler time, and there was a lot I, of novel things that I liked about it. It I, looks like a fun show. Good. It looks fun. Good. It, 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 it was the only <laughs> takeaway was the bad CG. Okay. And, good. And, and oh, I don't oh, mind. Chef's the, kiss. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. I'm happy. Good. Yeah. I'm no, happy. it is literally you're going like, wow, I wish you put more money into the CG here because I'm distracted by how bad some of this looks. You know, some of the shots are better than others, but there's like... Um, no, funny. It looks like it's gonna be a funny, irreverent show. Marvel's funny. When Marvel does funny TV, so far, like, like you know, WandaVision was great. I liked Hawkeye. Liked Hawkeye. Enjoyed the Hawkeye show. Ha ha uh, if I remember correctly, you binged it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I think binging it, I, I would agree with you a hundred percent. We had the unfortunate circumstance of week over weeking it and it got very frustrating. And so yeah. I suspect it got really good around episode three or four. I but, liked it from the I, beginning I, though. But I couldn't see it because of the yeah. the every week standing on its own. I, I liked it from the beginning. I, I liked it from the first episode. I'm like, oh this was fun. And and you know partially because like Captain America Winter Soldier was so bad. Loki Loki had two fun episodes, and then it just went off the rails. Yeah, then... I, I I think you and I dif uh, disagree on Loki. I I loved everything about a a uh, an evil Doctor Who working under duress. Just I loved I, everything about I, it. I, I like that premise, but like you know when you get to the end and he the what's his face you know uh, the ending is, is bad. Yeah. going over his plot and it's the same goddamn camera zoom in and it was so repetitive and I'm like it, it was uh, definitely uh, all shot in one room with a with a computer background yep and no idea of how to make it uh, anyway, yeah. anyhow well that's all neither here nor there <laughs> right. who's ready to talk about something really the, the weird the look of Loki was great the production design was fantastic there was a lot of promise then it just went like meh we're done yeah uh, alrighty, you guys want to do some weird things? Yes, although, yeah. uh, w one last time I'll say it, boy, between WandaVision and Loki, uh, and Spider-Man, I, I just don't see what Doctor Strange could have done showing up so late to the party with a conceit that had been nibbled away at three excellent oh. franchises before it. I think a clear objective and maybe giving us a trip through the multiverse. Those are my two things. Uh, yes. Uh, the only trip we got through the multiverse was about five seconds long. <laughs> and we entered up in a fascinating world where red means go and green means stop. <laughs> I, I imagine, imagine that uh, uh, 
what's her what's his face your buddy who did the first one Cargill uh yeah Scott Derrickson uh, Ma- Scott imagine Scott Scott and Derrickson and, and Cargill yeah yeah imagine Bloomhouse said hey we have to take over we've got ten million dollars guys go crazy it would have been amazing it would have been a ten million amazing, dollar you know. Doctor Strange yep. if anybody those yep, I would been yep yep yep. <laughs> But that would have been amazing. That's that's but. neither here nor there. I'll, I'll I'll not be speaking much more in public about this. <laughs> uh, buy, the, buy me a beer and show up on property, and we'll have some talks. Yeah. By the way, don't forget you can use the exclamation mark s command in the chat to submit show titles for the episode we're about to record. All right, you ready to do this thing, Andrew? Yes. All right, then I'm gonna catch you in in three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Mean, joined by Mr. Brian Brushwood. Hello. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hello. That's right. Those three guys. It's always the three of us. One blonde, two brunette. No gray hairs around here. What do you call a fourth leg on a stool? Uh, A chair. A a stair. Yeah, you call it a stair. Useless. Stair Useless. Yeah. Oh, okay. Got it. Okay. A All back, right. a good backing for your for <laughs> yeah. lumbar. I mean, it may make it slightly safer, but still. Yeah, hey. Uh, Hello. Hey, look up. Everybody look up. Uh, All right. Oh. All right. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, All right. It, maybe we ate 90 minutes. It'll pass. Did you see it? Oh, what, what, uh, what, no. what, what was Is it? Is there a bug? Boeing Starliners docked at the ISS. Remember the Boeing Starliner, our other crew capsule that was supposed to ferry astronauts to the National Space Station? I hate Years- that I'm the one going to ask this, but uh, remind me again which one that was. <laughs> <laughs> so, so NASA, eight, eons ago, is like, hey, you know what's cool? Eons ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, eons ago. You know what's cool? Space. You know what's cool too? Astronauts in space. You know what's really, really cool? Getting astronauts into space. Um, we're shutting down this space shuttle and well, you know, we have our reliable partners, the Russians. What could go wrong? <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, yeah, they're a little bit off kilter, but seriously, what is the craziest thing that they might try? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So NASA had decided they looked at the timetables to try to develop their own, you know, a timetable for developing, let's say, the SLS with the Orion spacecraft. Not to mention the fact that it was just horrendously expensive. It was cheaper to basically get, go to war with a new country every week than keep launching that. But hold on, let me get a pen. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> they, uh, they, uh, NASA did a program, had started their program, which was like, hey, let's just ask people to bid prices, and then you say you will do it for this, then you will do it for that price. I mean, it's a novel concept, you know, like, like we're not used to that idea of like, hey, Brian, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Ed, Ed, NASA, you know, I love you. I mean, uh, that's why I'm your uh, second in command. I'm, I've got your back. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, just throwing this out here, what say? Let's say we do the bidding thing. Great. Great. Let's let's say, like, you know, if they need a little more cash only, we just give it to them. Well, Mm. I I went to a store and I bought a thing. Yeah. Okay. I I need to buy a hat. Yep. 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 I paid $10 for it. Okay. Okay. But 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 they bid it up and they said that it would only be five. And then on checkout, it turned out to be 10, right? No, it's just 10. And then I took it home. And it was still and, ten. Uh, yeah, but but but, but like it was after the it fact? was defective, and there was nothing you could do about it. It blew up, right? It blew up. On well, actually, your head no. It or... was broken. I took it back to them, and they replaced it. Wait, wait for another for twenty. Another ten. Yeah. No, no, for free, for free, because they are the ones that See, screwed it I, up. I, I'm sorry, I, uh, I, I, um, uh, Ed Nasa. Uh, I have an assistant, uh, uh, Bed Nasa. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Bed. Bed, Bed we got to talk about Ed. He Bedford seems to have a little an upside down. I don't know where he's getting this idea that transactions are limited and singular. Uh, what's well, Let's just let. It's not like they'll ever actually make it to the space station. Ed. Anyway, Ed. Ed. We agree. Bed and me, Gred. <laughs> bed, yeah. Gred. Bed, we're, Gred. We're it's the Bed, try Gred this guarantee. Crazy, I say we try this crazy economic model where people agree to sell us something for a price and we hold them to it. Wow. That would be, uh, that would not, that's not the way we do it now. I agree with that in all principle, every single one, but you know how sometimes people go out on a ship or a boat and they decide they're in international waters. So land rules don't apply. That's how it is with space. Are you sure? Are you sure the rules apply in space? Well, we're going to make them apply. So, 
Uh, NASA said, hey, we're taking bids for who wants to try to provide crew. To we're going to pay for seats. We're just going to pay. We're not paying for spaceships. We're going to pay people to send people to the spaceship. You got a teleporter? Great. We'll pay you to use that. We don't care. You design your own rocket. Is that's the other thing is, Brian, is like instead of telling them that my hat had to have like three tricorns on it and some things that just didn't need at all, which is going to run up the price, I just said I needed a hat that protect me from the sun. In this case... They're like, get our astronauts to the space station alive, alive, mind you. Oh, mm, <laughs> um, okay. Oh. And they took several <laughs> bids. This is going back years ago. They took several bids, and the winning bids were, were SpaceX with the Crew Dragon and Boeing with the Starliner. And at the time, there was, this. remember this, there was the question, who is going to get astronauts to space first? And a lot of people are like, well, it's going to be Boeing because, you know, they're the experienced space because experts. Because they're the ones they who literally have gotten astronauts to space before. <laughs> Not anybody working on this program or in living memory, but the name Boeing was on rockets that went to space. So, sure. You know. Or the subsidiaries of companies that Boeing then bought. And, I mean, at the know, very least, they could call and copy off the notes of Northrop Grumman or whatever. <laughs> right. I yeah. mean, it's like so, they include the moon on their corporate map. Like, <laughs> so they Boeing did their Starliner, and I don't know if you've heard the news about Boeing and kind of like their engineering and design pipeline. Oh, is, is this a is this a, a sly reference to the seven thirty seven Max? Uh, yeah, they've had some issues and stuff. Like, oh, you want safety features too? That'll cost you extra. <laughs> like, like, I've got like, great... oh, I'm sorry. I thought we were agreeing like minimum viable product of getting bodies to space. Now all of a sudden they have to be alive. Ooh. Yeah, in a world where we have Spirit Airlines, like it's, we can't even. That's not the baseline anymore. We ain't, can go lower. Ain't you seen Star Trek Two: The Wrath of Khan? It's like we could put we we could put you in like a six foot long capsule. Some might call it a coffin. We could get that up there. Yeah, we could just throw that around. You're fine. So, so there was the debate on hey, like uh, you know, who was going to make it first? Was it going to be Boeing or is it SpaceX? Who would get astronauts into space first? Um, I think y'all know where this is going, but do you know how, again, Boeing has yet to fly astronauts into space yet. This was just this, what happened is they launched their Starliner like a year ago and there are several, mal there were several issues and malfunctions and Boeing's like, no, we got this. We're good to put astronauts on it. And NASA's like, you know what? We still need you to do that whole test mission because you didn't succeed the test mission. And that's the point of a test mission is to, you know, show that it succeeds. So Finally, they managed to get it to the International Space Station. You know, they haven't done the undocking to bring it back to Earth yet. And I heard there may have been some sort of launch anomaly, whatever, but I don't know the details on that. Um, it was two years ago next week that SpaceX first put astronauts into space. Two uh, wow. years ago. We, uh, if, if, for those who are fairly new to the podcast, one of my favorite aspects of this show is our split personality when it comes to wanting there to be multiple competitors, but also cheering for who's currently winning the race. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, uh, yes, it is. It is. Rough. This is a good new piece of news that they did a good test. Sure. That is correct. Uh, but also my goodness, five years ago, we did not expect, uh, team SpaceX to be so far ahead of, of, of the curve. Yeah, and uh, the mission, by the way, th it was three years ago that SpaceX did their unmanned mission. Wow. Yeah. And so a three-year three year lead, you know, Boeing is now where SpaceX was three years ago. Yeah, the, apparently they only lost two thrusters, so we're going to get more data on, like, were there thruster issues? <sighs> so here's a hypothetical question, and I... I I want to try to steel man this argument that I don't agree with. I, I do believe in intellectual property rights. I understand the reason to protect your innovations through a limited time patent and so on. However, um, remember, remember those uh, gliders, the, 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 the so-called hoverboards that, that yeah. just popped out of China and nobody could really point to where did these come from? Who made mm, them? The two and, wheels. Correct, yeah, correct. Yeah. And, and you know, many a collarbone was snapped. Many a wrist was, you know, uh, fractured uh, because everybody realized 
uh, basically over coffee after work. Like, oh, we're talking about this. Oh, I have these. We could put all these together. And all of a sudden, we were flooded with hoverboards. And you could objectively say that was not a great time. A lot of unsafe lithium ion battery explodey things were released. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people were injured because there was no centralized, you know, thought process through this whole thing. On the flip side, my daughter now has the most adorable pony. It's, it's, you sit on the pony and you grab it, and it's just a pony attached to one of those hoverboards, and she's able to ride it around or whatever. And we seem to have settled into a middle ground that works for everyone. So this is teeing up the question. Hypothetically, uh, understand I'm strong on property rights. I'm strong on intellectual property rights. I believe that the Hear SpaceX, that, everybody? Stop writing letters. Uh, 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 SpaceX has earned... I invented earned, that, by the way. SpaceX has earned, with its daring and bold uh, initiatives, the place that it has. However, now it pains me to see so many laggards trying to go their own way with one-time-use rockets or whatever. And part of me... And, and this is this is antithetical to everything I believe politically, but I do feel a conscientious need to at least consider what it would be like if a lightning bolt struck and everything that that SpaceX knew, everybody knew. I I would say the the patents or the design is five percent of it. And it is a I I highly I highly recommend uh, Tim Dowd uh, Dodd Everyday Astronaut. He's done a couple. He's he's got a new behind the scenes tour of Starbase with Elon Musk. It is the engineering culture which SpaceX has told people about. This is I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to give you an example of something. Okay. Okay. Five years ago, it was about four or five years ago when they're gearing up to do the Model Three production. They had a guy who was an industry, one of these industry analysts paid by you know, investment fund managers, did the tour of the Tesla factory in Fremont, and he wrote his report, and it was a scathing report about the Tesla 3 factory. And one of the things he singled out is he said, hey, you know, they don't know what they're doing. They're making their own seats. He says they're making their own seats and... This is extremely inefficient because to try to try to build seats, Tesla's trying to build everything. He said, because they're trying to do building their own seats, this is just a mistake because you can buy those cheaper, you can buy them easier. And it's just, Elon Musk doesn't know what he's doing. This is a screw up. This is why I'm putting a negative rating on the Tesla stock, et cetera, okay? Um, and that was, you know, that was like, people like, yeah, this is Tesla doesn't know what they're doing. Everybody else is like, a, just buy your seats from some manufacturer in Mexico or someplace else like this, put them in there and don't have this. Can I guess that this analysis happened pre-pandemic? Well, not, it, it happened pre-pandemic and I have a headline from one week ago. Rivian, who's trying, it makes these, they look great electric car, electric pickup trucks. Rivian warns dispute with seat suppliers threatens production of Amazon delivery vans. They've got a deal for 100,000 Amazon delivery vans, and they say they're not going to, maybe more to it than this, but they say they're not going to be able to do it because they can't get seats. And, and this also, um, uh, not, not to conflate Tesla with uh, SpaceX, but certainly there's shared DNA between the two. And in the case of Tesla, we had a microchip shortage where the default answer, the sensible answer, the answer that no board of directors would question would be a shrug of the shoulders and saying, constraint, supply, uh, delivery, don't have the chips, can't do the thing. And they would be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but SpaceX, correct me uh, if I'm getting this wrong, said, what if we wrote new code? Tesla. To yeah, use, yeah. Or, sorry, sorry uh, uh, yeah. Tesla. What if we wrote new code to use chips yeah. that we can get our hands on? Yeah, exactly. Tesla... That's the Tesla idea is like they're, it's engineering driven. It's engineer driven, not even manager driven. It's engineer driven. And, and there may be mistakes. There's, they've had F ups and stuff like this too. But like you pointed out pre pandemic, it seemed crazy to do that. But also when you're going for such scale, like they're going for, you do want to have control because the problem test Elon realized in trying to build the model S before, let's say you were trying to produce 20,000 model S's and you need steering wheels and your steering wheel manufacturer in Korea all of a sudden gets a bulk order from Hyundai, you're being told you're gonna have a three month delay. Right, or you, or have, you wanna renegotiate the price you're paying per- But mm -hmm. you have 20,000 cars you can't ship. 
because right. of that wheel, because that one supplier was able to do that. And now SpaceX is does the same thing with streamlining the, the amount of stuff they build. People go, that's crazy, but also where they source. We told the example before about when you have to have, you have to have an air conditioner unit to keep your satellite cool when it's out on the launch pad. And that they, SpaceX goes, gets, NASA has a ton of resources information and SpaceX will use, hey, what do you know about heat tiles? Tell us whatever. Mm -hmm. They went to NASA like, hey, what do you use to keep your satellite cool? Like, oh, we use this company. They're the only company that really makes these. It's a $3 million unit to keep the satellite cool. SpaceX went, looked at this like it's an industrial HVAC and, and like, Oh no, but it's like no, like no, that's exactly what it is. So they just bought an industrial a AC unit, put it on the tower, put the ducting in there. They spent like five grand, and that's how they keep the satellite cool. And they didn't. Sp and everybody else is like, and so when you when you talk about how these other companies, it's not so much that SpaceX has this secret sauce. It's SpaceX has a problem solving capability that's harder for them to implement. Well, uh, so. This kind of makes me uh, think we could take as long as you want on this side loop, but um, one time on a panel show, I got into a heated exchange with science fiction author uh, uh, Jerry Purnell, where he was very much against the reliance on just-in-time management. Uh, mm -hmm. He felt like it was a weakness that eventually was really going to bite uh, America, the world, in the butt. And I made the counter-argument that it's like, well— you know what else relies on just in time management? My lungs, my heart, my liver, you know, my physical body operates as though those oxygen rich red blood cells are going to show up. And over the last few years, I can't deny that we've had some nasty run ups of costs of things and, and challenges, specifically because just in time ban management suddenly didn't work. Uh, or what's that? Just time manufacturing. Oh, manufacturing. Oh, management and manufacturing. Because, like in the case of, um, uh, let's say, toilet paper, there was a brief run on toilet paper. It wasn't that we couldn't make enough, and right now we're experiencing that with fo baby formula. And uh, according to economists, they are fast to point out this is because nobody wants to be seen for the bad PR disaster of raising the costs of baby formula. So instead, nobody raises the costs, and as a result, everybody buys as much as they can, and, and we can't get enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a result, especially for people like, like my daughters who have food allergies, uh, all of a sudden, you know, if, if they were younger, I would have been the guy saying, I will pay 10x the price if you will just give me this one that is manufactured in a facility that has never touched a peanut or, or what have you. Yeah, I, like to your point about that, it, 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 when you had China at this, when China was going through this extreme growth rate of like building factories every minute and expanding, 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 you can look at this and say, there is going to be a moment, this is going to flat, there's going to be, this is going to drop off and it's going to be more gradual. But in that uptake, when that uptake, when you're like, oh, there is a new manufacturer for something you need every other day, it kind of made sense to take advantage of just in time uh, you know, management of like inventory management and product manufacturing. It took, it made sense because you're like, Oh, there is more people willing to supply. The supply is way outstripping the demand. There's always going to be more supply. And we we thought that we made the mistake of thinking that the future is just the version, a bigger version of the present when in reality, like, no, that's going to curve. There's going to be a point where they can only create so many factories that are competing for each other. And they're going to start competing on price. And then they're going to start dropping out. And then we're going to get, you know, disruptions like we have now and scarcity issues. And all of a sudden that all falls apart. Um, that's, you know, that's the problem is I think Purnell's point is Purnell was a being a much older guy who's lived through shortages and things like this, have seen that cycle. His attitude is like, yeah, it'll be good. You know, it might be good for five, 10 years, but then when it's not, it'll be a disaster. Yeah. And, and I must admit, look, uh, past three years have not been any kind of picnic, but uh, uh, I, I, starvation deaths don't seem to be the leading cause of people passing. It's, you know, it's stuff like refusal to take a vaccine, not to provoke anyone. But um, uh, the, uh, I, I, I suppose it was, it was fascinating, like 10 years ago, I had never seen a shortage of anything in my life except for Transformers, Cabbage Patch dolls, and Star Wars figurines. Uh, I, I, the very concept was strange to me. Instead, over the next 20 years, all I saw was 
people complaining about too many choices, choice paralysis. There's no way we can know which Smucker's brand jam to pick when there's so many. This is terrible. Uh, and then, um, and then uh, I don't know, having just a little bit of a taste makes me reconsider that position. I think, I think it's a matter of, I, I think it, it's, you have to be, you have to pay attention to the world and not so much the experts. Because like, like I said, I think Just In Time worked for certain things for a period of time, but then you could sort of predict, you know, the thing that we have going into, you know, we talk about how we know we have shortages. In theory, there probably will be a glut at a certain point because there might be an overproduction on stuff. Uh, other things, maybe not so. Uh, but, uh, you know, as, as far as, you know, back to like how you make decisions, like you have to think differently about this, I guess, a kind of the scale you want to go to. So like you and I running kind of small businesses compared to a Tesla, we have to think about like, you know, but even still we see the inventory. I realized like with me, with my products that I would rather pay $3 to have something made and make a $2 profit than pay a buck 50 and make like, you know, 350 profit if I don't have to have any inventory on my shelf. Right. Because I don't have to make predictions about the future. Once I got rid of how to make predictions about the future and I could just keep whatever I needed in supply or just do on demand, I made much less money per item but I could grow faster. You know, there's a lot of these sort of counterintuitive things about business where the conventional wisdom says this, but you're like, okay, but here's this other condition. And you'd be like, oh, change everything. Like, like Apple, people go like, well, Apple orders from all these manufacturers. Like Apple, Apple rents floor space and lets them handle the hiring. Like Apple computer screens and Apple stuff like this, Apple owns the machines. Apple will own the machines on that these things are made on. They will lend the money to the manufacturer to do this. Like Apple controls way more of their product line than people realize. There's a reason Tim Cook is running Apple, and that is he was Mr. Logistics. He understood the reality of logistics. You hear stories about how Apple would like book entire flights, always has X number of seats reserved on flights to China, because they've got to keep the things going. They've got to keep the product flowing. And you can't just say, oh, I'm just going to rely on my contact over there and somewhere else to make sure that I'm getting my product. Apple is keen to that. Well, and uh, uh, to loop things back to the original bidding question with NASA, like ultimately NASA, NASA doesn't care how you get human bodies living to the space station. They just care that you can. If somebody had a crazy scheme that involved seven giant uh, aluminum balloons that uh, with a platform and a rocket that you know got yeah. up to the stratosphere and then took off from there if if it worked and was reliable and was cheapest then it's like uh, all nasa cares about is do they arrive do they arrive safe great um when it comes to the just-in-time management uh you're right i'm i'm not a fan of holding on to inventory either but what we've noticed in uh, this is getting into more kind of after things territory. But what we've noticed is oftentimes we try to map a story that needs a certain product. And maybe that product just is not available anymore. Then that doesn't mean that our version of the product is dead. What it means is, is there another version of the story we can tell that involves another item and, and try to make it happen? Sometimes, like in, in some cases, it means we reach out and say, hey, how come you don't make this thing anymore and they were like oh well we made them for this other reason and it's like well would you make them for us and they're like i don't know what do you want it to say oh it could say something and you know then you discover things that you didn't even know were were possible but but yeah in general holding inventory not great yeah and there are times where it's the only choice you have and i think that the the thing that there was a story if you watch uh the documentary about the guy who created jelly belly the Jelly Belly Jelly Beans. This guy was an inventor, a candy inventor his whole life. He comes up with this hit, Jelly Belly. And the way it's told in the documentary, there might be more to it, but the manufacturer that was making his Jelly Bellies came to him and said, we're, we're buying your company. And he's like, ah, I don't want to sell. Like, nope, we're buying you. Or it's no more Jelly Beans. And Oh, he, wow. That's it's as the story was told. And he was in this position where he's like, what do you do when the person actually making your product says this? And it's like, well, that's why uh, a lot of times um, you have to have two sources. Like in manufacturing, one of the things is make sure you have two sources to get something because of that exact, exact problem where all of a sudden your manufacturer says, we're going to raise your price. What do you do? And it's one of the reasons the arguments for markets, the, the ability of markets is it keeps that kind of extortion. It keeps that problem. You're like, no, there should only be one candy manufacturer. Why do we need many? Like, well, 
somebody wants to raise prices, what do you do? You have no choice. So, but it's a very interesting story where like basically that that's that version is Jelly Belly is no longer his company because the manufacturer's like, we like this company, it's ours. Wow. Uh, I'll tell In you industry. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I'll tell you one industry where there's one monopoly monopoly and it's great is oh, yeah? uh, this show. Ooh. The only place to get it is here from us. Huh? Uh, three out of four hosts agree. <laughs> you only yeah. need three hosts for weird things. <laughs> I'm the one that disagrees. <laughs> <laughs> Two out of four agree. <laughs> no, Justin would be here. Uh, yeah, join us at patreon.com slash weird things. Get after things uh, uh, a little bit earlier than everybody else. Our podcast all about being creative professionals, talking about behind the scenes stuff, all the stuff that we're doing here. Uh, and it all gets into one easy feed, no logins. Uh, everybody hates logins. So check it out, patreon.com slash weird things. Thank you. So we got a really cool email. Uh, somebody sent this to us because they spotted this on a forum and one of our one of our readers had did a little bit of sleuthing and I think has a very plausible explanation. Uh, Bryce, do you have a story in front? Do you want me to read it? Uh, yeah, can you please read it? I'm pulling it up now. Okay, so uh, this person saw this on a Facebook post and it was somebody reporting an animal sighting. And so this was not our listener, but our listener saw this and then has their theory on this. And they write, the, 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 the post was from a, I don't I won't say the name because I don't know if we should say it or not, but my fiance and I, fiance were just cruising around on a late night drive. I think we're on Sherman or at least very close to Sherman. I don't know where that is. We are going down the end of that. It's surrounded by trees on the left side and houses on the right towards where you can turn left to Green Hills. We saw a black figure that looked like the size of a person, pretty thin, but running on all fours. It looked bipedal and so much like a thin person full speed spring on their hands and feet, but it looked right at us and its eyes were glowing a red orange. Its hind legs were definitely longer than its front legs. It ran from the tree line into a yard with a white house. When we passed, we couldn't see where it went to, fi went to figure out what the hell it was. I can't imagine what kind of animal it could have been other than a bear and definitely not a healthy one at that. Are there bears up here? And if so, are they really that close to town? We were both in shock, scared the hell out of us. We immediately headed home and did not stick around to figure out what the F it was. So we, we like to flip the switch between playing the credulous role and the detective role. Which, mm -hmm. which one do you want to play during this? Me? Uh, both of us. Uh, uh, I kind of, I've seen, I got this. I've seen already, this. Yeah, this email went through me, so I've seen this. Oh, wait, wait. So, so, so there is an answer. Can, well, we have, we don't have an answer. Our, our, we have an idea. Uh, okay. RJ, RJ, who sent this to us, RJ Jackson, sent us his very convincing theory of what this is. Well, uh, so before, before we get to something that likely is the answer, let me uh, speculate with, with the way my, my brain works. Yeah, take a shot. Um, take a shot at it. So, oh, so, give it a shot. Uh, 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 first of all, uh, sure, maybe a critter nobody's seen before, but, but more importantly, Let's call it a critter that the writer is unfamiliar with before. Uh, and let's take it to uh, the specifics that they're thinking of. Uh, said it looked and moved like a bear. I don't know what a very thin, emaciated, ill bear would look like. Mm. But uh. I would imagine it might look like a human loping forward. Glowing eyes, that, that part I can imagine... Uh, eye shine, you know, dilated eyes, having something light shining at them and reflecting back. Mm. I can even, going a step farther, me personally, Brian Brushwood, we did an episode where I learned how to walk on stilts. I immediately thought I should also get the arm stilt things so I could walk around like a, uh, a, a giraffe in the Broadway production of The Lion King. Mm. Uh, this is a real thing, me personally, I would do. If I were to do it, on an unpopulated road, it might occur to me to stealth up and, and wear all black or do something crazy. Now, all of this is fairly unlikely for most humans, but not very unlikely for me personally, Brian Brushwood. So uh, 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 the, the, uh, this is what I say about UFOs and stuff. Mm -hmm. Just because you don't understand a thing, that when you don't understand why a thing is happening, that should be the end of the road. But instead, mm. people don't like getting to the end of the road and not having an answer. Yeah. So they tend to just say, 
alien. It's an alien. Right. And they right. make up an answer. They right. find right. an answer. Because, they craft it, feels, an because answer. it feels better, yeah, right? Absolutely. But whereas, whereas I am totally comfortable hitting the end of the road <laughs> and saying, yep, don't know. Uh, but, 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 but even this story, I, I can picture a quirky someone like Brian Brushwood or an emaciated bear. Uh, that's, that's all I got. Uh, I, I think all are, could be likely the clip that RJ sent us, I think shows us too, that when you see something late at night or whatever, the fact that the thing that stood out to me in the story is that it ran around a house into a yard. And that applies to me, pet. Yes. Uh, mm. a, a place, something running home. Yeah. And so, uh, Bryce, do you have a video? Yes, we do. So, uh, this is a oh, that, Scottish that's a beautiful dog. It is. It is a Scottish deerhound, and it def. If you've ever seen, if you've seen the pictures of uh, like where they've taken a bear and shaved it, it kind of looks like that. It's got medium length hair, not long, not uh, not short either. Well, uh, pic picture an extremely shaggy greyhound. I mean, it yeah. it, it, it is a very but thin pup. Thin, and it is pretty big. It does look like a big dog. Where it's in a field, so we can't really get a good scale, but. Uh, hey, this looks like a this looks like a thin bear, uh, or 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 a weird uh, uh, hellhound or something. Um, uh, w once, and I think that's part of the reason we see oftentimes uh, things that are supposed to be chupacabras or what have you mm -hmm. turn out to be emaciated or manged, um, uh, more common critters. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to say on Reddit recently, I saw there was a success story of somebody who had inherited a uh, like a cairn hound or something that that was that was like about to starve to death and that is a real thing that you would see mm. uh, uh but 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 it had markings on its face that were white patches that looked like the shape of a skull and also it was skeletal at the uh. time so it's like uh, yeah no I, I would believe seeing something like that and thinking it's a demon dog or something yeah gosh and then you mix in the yeah you mix in the light iris you know the red eye effect that animals have the eye shine very yeah. very pronounced like totally that makes more sense than a a thin bear or a bear that is like starved or like and, and and it's so funny because like i walked right past it being a more common animal uh, based on the nature of the story. Like, like once you anchor any kind of crazy idea, it's very hard every time you tell the story and use the words, you know, like a guy with extra long arms or like a bear that was extra tall and lanky. Yeah. Uh, like, like uh, this is a uh, uh, thing to ICU who found this. This is a picture of one of those no haired bears. What? And wow. that, that kind of looks like a dog. That kind of looks like a stumpy little dog, doesn't it? It, and, well, and it definitely looks uh, alien or, or almost human. Like, like, uh, Oh yeah. Cause it's kind of got hair. Well, and, and because look at the musculature, like if, if you put on a baggy trash bag suit and an alien face, yeah, that that could be a very talented uh, Broadway puppeteer. Someone warn Missy Misdemeanor Elliot. <laughs> she famously wore a trash bag. Okay, okay good. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know if we were being offensive no. or not. <laughs> famously, she wore a trash bag on the red carpet. <laughs> I yeah, I remember when I took the photo of the mangy raccoon in the park that looked like a chupacabra and was just. That dude, poor raccoon, like, help me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know what happened. I just got no hair. <laughs> um, but like, uh, like, even domestic animals, like, my favorite Twitter account lately has been cats being weird little dudes. And it's just pictures of cats in weird positions because cats and animals are just flexible and they're weird little guys. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, good, good. Uh, I was just going to say, boy, oh boy, are we quick to notice and acknowledge when an animal moves in an unusual way that is pleasant or happy. Uh, man, oh man, do we not want to admit those are our household pets when they move in a way that is freaky and weird. Uh, and uh, Bryce, if you don't mind calling out my, my Twitter history, somebody, I, I tweeted out um, that my Weimar honor, whenever I, uh, we go in the back acreage and I throw rocks she very rarely finds them in the tall grass, but uh, but when she when I hold one up, she she does this tap dance thing, uh, and uh, mm. somebody recently put uh, the Belle Biv DeVoe 
poison song <laughs> to it. <laughs> and it was it was very, very funny. But 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 there was something about that tap dancing motion that again it triggers the aw cute dog who is doing something human like and cute. But if it's there it is. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 when it's not cute, who boy is easy to just think alien. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we. Uh, I remember when. I mean, this was a segment from many many years ago. But I remember on this show, uh, I, you were kind of leading this topic, Andrew. But the idea of uh, yeah, the what the European dragon is uh, is mm -hmm. probably may have just been an alligator in an unfamiliar crocodile. Yeah. or crocodile in the wrong biome. You have, because you had stories, a lot of them come from, like, Turkey and places like this that just a thousand or two thousand years ago, you had a medieval warm period, and then you had the, the Roman warm period, would have been very entirely possible for you to have had crocodiles and things that have, would have incurred their way up there. Yeah. Um, so, to me, it seems very likely. Uh, and the thing that we make the mistake of when we think about history is we just look at our globe and we imagine it, you know, with different lines, when... You know, there is, you know, one of the southernmost islands in the British Isles used to be a Roman farm. You go there now, like, where's the farm? It's underwater. Oh. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's, that's what happens from a sea level and erosion. These things change. You know, the stories of uh, Atlantis and the stories of uh, Lost City of Z is, uh, I forget the name of it, but, you know, there is probably, there was part of the, partly, part of the English coast, like a city along a shelf that just fell in, you know, is, I think, why I just probably just fell into the sea once, you know, like maybe been like 1,200 years ago. And like, what happened to them? Don't know. Went there, wasn't there. Yeah, so. wild. Boy, oh boy, do humans not like that end of the story of who knows? <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> it's all gone forever. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Maybe uh, that's why. Uh, uh, no, go ahead. That was my no, thing please. I, I was going to stand say maybe that's why people are like a little obsessed with blockchains right now. The idea of like very permanent history and not just history, a public but transactions. ledger that is that is globalized and so redundant that that there, there's data somewhere. They so you someone can figure out the data eventually, but it's, I, I, it's I, so hard to I, do. I, that. I've mentioned this before. Uh, the sequel to Sapiens by uh, 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 Yuval Harari uh, was uh, Homo Deus, and um, I believe it was in that book that he was talking about uh, 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 as a religion, dataism. The the idea that don't worry about it. It's all recorded somewhere. And mm -hmm. just by the numbers, there's not enough mass on the earth to record everything that happens for the next hundred years. And, and, yet. and yet, yes, we might come up with co uh, clever compression algorithms. It's holographic compression, whatever. But that was a sobering fact for me because I just, I just assumed, and, and there, there's a little bit of a bias because we have the kind of community that is so <laughs> diligent and good about uh, grabbing great moments and holding on to them. And, yeah. you know, uh, if, and if one of us can ask, which was the episode where the something, something, something happens, sure. and there's enough redundancy that we can find it. But And, uh, like, uh, you know, like, in execution, it is even, it is less scarier, right? Like, we, people, people take a sense of, like, what do we need to actually preserve? Like, like when I do marbles, the database thing that I use is not very high performance. So I can't keep track of everything that I would love to keep track of just because the thing would be too slow. Like, um, and so I just have to decide, like, I just need to lose data right here. Well, and and, and you just, there's a certain amount of that that people will have to do uh, on their own. Here's the bizarre part is... Um, uh, emotionally, because we're we're you know flawed wetware beings, uh, are we okay with the idea that as long as you know the starting conditions, you know how many players there were, the shape of the course, and the order in which people won, mm -hmm. maybe that's all you need because everything else could be interpolated, similar to like a low resolution, you know uh, VGA photo of Obama can be upscaled to 4K, 60 frames per second. Do, doing a thing mm. like as long as it pretty much is right is that okay like, well and then you think of morally like, like w what is the difference of because this is a thing in, in video games right now with um dlss right you can have a uh, your graphics card uh upscale and and algorithmically 
figure out what your 1080p picture should look like in 4K. And it mostly works. It's a little fuzzy, but it mostly works. Uh, what is the power and the the time and that it takes to to develop and run an engine like that versus putting a few more transistors in there to make it more powerful natively? And I, there's going to be answers on on for, for both use cases, but that's kind of where we're at. Is when can machines it, approximate? Uh, uh, data, uh, uh, Bryce. I'm almost certain you've brought this up before, but aren't there aren't there video cards that are using eye tracking to only bother to render the parts of the screen that you're looking at? Or, Foveated rendering. That's or, or, generally how rendering uh, is done. Yeah, not in meat space, but in the in the camera in space. V here. VR and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and that's you know that has been a, a, a part of 3D rendering for three or live 3D rendering for a while now. So. We, we we do tend to compress to figure out how to get data around in the right time but it Did I tell you it takes a while my story about foveated rendering uh, is 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 this the one where where you figured out very quickly the trick to make it feel like you're in a bigger room than you were in oh no this was I was talking to uh, talking to James Randy and we were talking about in in the library at the James Randy Foundation and talking about this and Randy was talking about pointing this out about how the, the there's the fovea and there's the parafovea outside of it and then peripheral vision and explaining that and i'm like you know i was i was like playing in the video toaster at the time and all that and it was so compression heavy i'm like i wonder this is early 1990s and i'm like i wonder if you could just solve if it'd be easier to compress if you just compressed because of based on fovea to rendering so i go in there and i mm. do like ibm had the patent search back then so i go to the ibm patent search and this would imply that it had been in work for years, but literally the patent had been applied for a month before. Oh, wow. So Not that I would never beat anybody on that, but it sure, was sure, that, sure. that, but, that but, right time, that right sort of question. Uh, yeah. uh, this is sort of the, uh, uh, in a historical context, the great man versus the right time theory. You know, it's like, did this happen because this great leader happened to show up and make it happen, or did, did it not matter? If mm -hmm. it wasn't this guy, it would have been somebody else. Yeah, yeah I think because of... That it, it was an obvious sort of place to go to when you're trying to figure out how to compress and what, how do you, where would you go with the algorithm? So clearly other people had thought of it, but it was a very, but then it sort of faded for a while. And then I saw it pop again with VR, like, oh, we'll just, we're going to use this method of only rendering where the eye is looking. It's like, yeah, it's, it's been a well, thing and, for 25 and, and years. <laughs> we, we, we had already kind of seen a precursor of that 20 years ago, uh, uh, almost 30 years ago, with MP3s. Basically, it's like you take the range of sounds that human ears can hear, and it's like just chop up above this, chop below but that. All of a sudden, it's a lot simpler. And then reduce the sampling rate uh, you know, to something tolerable yep. to where you could dist distinguish voices. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It's uh, uh, it's good stuff. Yeah, we're we're like in a we're compression, man. Learn it. I'm gonna show you something cool. If you go to a YouTube channel, okay. I don't think I've talked about this company, this group before, but it's First Light Fusion, hmm. and there is a lot of different companies. More companies than ever are working on trying to solve the problem of fusion and coming up with different approaches. I, First. And, uh, 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 this is me professing my ignorance. I know there there's a problem with fusion, uh, 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 and I it, uh, largely to do with containment of massive temperatures and efficiency. Beyond that, I really don't know what the problem of fusion is. Well, that that's just it. Is that it takes a tremendous amount of energy to start the process, and if you don't capture enough energy, then you're not. It's not a surplus of energy. It's, it's so negative, energy. and yeah, yeah. And so there are trying to contain stuff. I, I watched, there's a video from like 20 years ago uh, where uh, uh, the guy that Bussard, who came up with a Bussard Ramjet, who was one of the pioneers of fusion technology, actually one of the pioneers of the Takamak design, spoke at Google and talked about, no, this design's not, is a dead end. We shouldn't be pursuing this. Yet that still is like all the major fusion engineers are still using the, the Takamak ring design. And he's like, because we're so focused on this, we're missing out on all the other ways we could reach fusion. And in those projects are sort of run by people who've been part of those projects for 20 or 30 years. And that's one of the problems of legacy science is that if you bring in like, hey, here's a new approach, like, no, we've got a, you know, my job now is to keep $300 million a year coming into this facility. There is no money for this other thing. Well, what if this doesn't work? My job is the employees and the people working here right now, not 
to actually solve the problem, the thing you think I'm trying to solve. That's really what I'm trying to do. So there are a lot of companies that are privately funded that are working towards different systems, um, doing different kinds of you know containment. This is pretty neat because First Light has says that they've they've had some promising results. It's a UK company. What they use is if you see if you go back to that image there, you'll see this uh, this clear this clear plastic cube. Basically, they put their fusible element inside of there, and then they basically use a gun to shoot this thing, and it creates a shock wave that surrounds it and compresses it. And then they have this curtain of, uh, like a lithium curtain, I forget what it is, that captures the energy from it. So if you see some videos there, so they're basically, they're right now they're using a gun that's like, like literally like a powdered charge. But they're gonna sh they're gonna switch to a railgun type thing, and you can see another graphic they show where this thing being just dropped and shot down, and how it just explodes. And so it's like once every second or a couple seconds they would be you know combusting one of these. So uh, uh, for forgive my reductionist attempt to understand, uh, uh, similar to Fat Man and Little Boy were two different f uh, fission bombs. One mm -hmm. was so obviously going to work that they never even tested it. That's quite literally just, it, we're, we're just gonna punch a chunk of uranium so hard, it's gonna cause a chain reaction and explode. That, that was little boy. Uh, whereas Fat Man was, we're gonna do a series of synchronized detonated charges on a larger thing that is going to compress and, and explode. Uh, to, okay. to, to, to the best of your understanding, Andrew, do I have that much right? Fat Man was the implosion type bomb, and then Little Boy. Again, I I get them confused uh, too. Um, I, I I think somebody correct us. Uh, 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 where are we writing? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, check the show notes. Nashcom at gmail .com, Weird things and stuff like that. So likewise, what we're seeing is sort of a right now we're seeing a sloppy attempt at fu or sloppy confirmation of fusion with just straight up some kind of explosive chemical reaction. That, that hits hard enough to cause fusion, uh, but who knows how much of that energy is being captured or whatever. But a real gun would be a, a much more energy efficient way to reach a projectile hitting the same speed. And if it was in the right medium where fusion could be achieved, and more importantly, all of that, um, uh, that curtain of energy uh, as motion could be captured and converted into electricity or uh, potential energy of, of, of your liking. And it, it, is yeah, that I mean, anywhere close? Yeah, I mean, their their goal is, you know, to, to create fusion, you got to take your, your, your take your material, which could, you know, generally use deuterium, some places using beryllium, compress it, and then squeeze it together. So you get your helium, and then you get your your energetic reaction and producing the other material from that. Um, and so here's a diagram showing the way this thing works, where it's using basically the yeah, inside of this plastic block or this medium, it's using just the the shock waves are so powerful. So you see the thing explode, and there's like a, that's a curtain of like a chemical that captures the heat, and then it just oh, got keeps it. dropping. So, got it. So in this case, we're converting the 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 fusion is converted into heat energy that can be yep. used to pow power more traditional uh, turbine and, engines. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Wow. Yep. Wow. That's a uh, uh, that's. You know what? What is exciting is that they have. Uh, seems like they have a new industrial design for this. I mean, there are f there are fusion. There is fusion, but it's not efficient or it's uh, net negative. So, yeah, m more ideas is better because uh, once we solve that, man. And it's a very different. You look at this is what's crazy about fusion, and the thing that I liked about this, like I don't know if they're going to reach. I don't know if this is going to work or not, but I mean, conceptually, is you look at the the large. We talk about the Tokamak reactors, which are these big, huge torus shaped electromagnets using superconducting magnets that are then like basically in, able to in, confine in my eye in, in my mind i always think of the stark uh, uh arc reactors <laughs> when i'm picturing that well it, but here it's literally a few uh, it's a plastic or it's a cube a couple centimeters across with the material you're trying to fuse inside of it and then like a, a copper disc that gets just smashed into there and creates the shock wave inside of there so it gets surrounded by either side and all it, it's so much energy it has to sort of it's wow. a very, you know, I, very amazing sort of idea. Yeah, 
you know what's funny is like, uh, okay, so if this works reliably, the first thing I think of is like, oh my gosh, an actual fusion reaction, that's going to be too much energy, it's going to break out of uh, whatever cage it's in. But, but really, if you have a, a stable medium, all you have to do is just make a big enough collection of the medium that it can absorb all of it, where, you know, I don't know, I'm making, at this point, I'm making stuff up, but... Um, you know, I could picture an Olympic-sized swimming pool of the medium that raises one degree centigrade every time uh, this this fires, and then eventually it gets hot enough that you're able to power turbines. Yeah, I my prediction, weird things, audience, and hold me to it. By the end of this decade, we're going to have practical fusion. I'm not saying it's going to be widely deployed, and that you're going to be getting it on your outlet, but I'm going to say that we're going to have fusion that is capable of working in an industrial capacity by the end of this decade uh you know what i'll double down on your prediction and say somebody out there will be against it <laughs> <laughs> i'm well, gonna bet <laughs> i'm gonna bet it rhymes with mexon <laughs> well uh, matt ridley has an article that talks about like the biggest fear is going to be the regulatory would be that if we have it and then we shut it, it should be treated like an industrial and not like a nuclear energy. It should be treated like an industrial, any other industrial sort of like industry a coal should be treated. Or a hydroelectric. Well, no, or... not those get those are heavily regulated. Like like I have a power like plant. I don't make microwaves. You know, yeah. I run an industrial microwave somewhere. You know, so that you're not you're not being regulated to hell. That that would be some. Now you you could couch that as, and I'm sure somebody will, as nuclear sleight of hand, but also uh, it would be accurate to couch it that way and would maybe spare us half a century of misinformation uh, uh it's it's astonishing to me that we have we have nuclear fission plants that run on the waste of other nuclear fission plants uh, and 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 that um uh just the pr problem is, is what is yeah, keeping us we, from a very green energy. Had we gone nuclear back when we should have gone nuclear, we wouldn't be as worried about climate change as we are now. And that's part of the thing is the same of the same people who are, ah, the climate change, like, cool. Can we go nuclear? No. Uh, you know. Well, and uh, now, uh, I, I, to, to, to be fair and steel man the other side, we don't know how many... Uh, how many scary moments there might be in the alternate future where we did 10 times as many nuclear plants as we've wow. done. But I do know, I do know that we've built entire ready to function nuclear fission plants that just never got the regulatory approval. And now they're museums of what a nuclear we, plant would and, look like. Uh, and, and we, the problem we've had too, is a number of the nuclear like Fukushima and these other ones were because we, because the industry was so slowed down, it was hard to add the improvements. Like the way we design it today, the way we would design a brand new plant in 1990 would be different than the way it was in 1970, but these 1970s plants were kept online because you couldn't build the new plants. Right. And that was part of the problem. It's like, hey, we don't like cars. We're not gonna allow any cars designed after 1970 on the road. Well, cars would be very dangerous and inefficient, you know? And so, and like, yeah, there would act mistakes would be made. But if you ask, like, well, which would be worse? You know, the math is clearly on the side I mean, of who would have been better I, off I, in the nuclear I'm, future. I, and, and I, too, am on your side. Uh, but, 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 uh, uh, I, in fact, I think most of our audience is already I all know. on the yeah, I'm about to say, I'm like, we're, this is the third week in a row that we're running and not being chased on nuclear. Yeah. <laughs> but I would yeah. say that, but looking, my point is to say, though, is that the, the scary thing, though, is that I think we, we're like, yeah, we see, we, we're at the point like, oh, we could see this happening. Now we see, oh, yeah, but somebody's going to try to shut this down or they're going to this. Oh, what about this risk? What about the containment walls or whatever? It's like, great. Here we go. Uh, but. Think about a future that has really has abundant energy. That promise. This is the first sense of scale we get now. You can see the little ladder in the corner there. You know what is a future like when energy really is too cheap to meter? Uh, I'll tell you one thing that definitely changes is a lot of the um, legitimate gripes about, uh, uh, let's say, cryptocurrencies or what have you about them being uh, energy hogs. Uh, go away um that's all i got right now i'll have to yeah, think more and no, and, I, and that you know that assumes that like the power grid goes fully fusion right away or you know it doesn't take 200 years to replace coal or oil with what 
is on paper a very safe area, should be a very effective generation yeah. of power source. So. Yo, you got any picks? I have oh picks. I've, I've got a pick. Yeah. Oh, please, Bryce. Go yeah. Ahead your pick. Here we go. Okay. Um. Yes. Uh. This I found this on YouTube. I have been watching a lot of YouTube lately, and uh, one thing that YouTube has been uh, recommending me is there's a lot of video game content, like uh, essays and little history bits. And uh, the one that I really enjoyed, I watched the other night, it's about a half hour, um, is from a creator called uh, Hummel, Hummel Dawn, Hummel Dawn uh, called Spyro's Hidden Gem of a Category, The Art of Speedrunning. Um, and uh, he basically talks about this, uh, if, if you know about video game speedrunning, usually it's how do you finish the game as fast as possible or get everything in the game as fast as possible. And this was a joke category made in 2015 uh, for the original Spyro, the dragon game, where you have to go into every level and as quick as possible reach the exit point of the level. Because normally people don't bother with the exit because you can just leave wherever. So it becomes a little bit of a race. And over the years, people have... It started as a joke and people start as a joke and then they really want to figure it out. And the other part is like, it was only like a 20 minute run. So it ends up being fast compared to the normal traditional runs that are hours long. Um, it's, it's a, it's a really good story and uh, very well, like good animations and graphics. Uh, the narration is very good. Uh, they even, he even talks about the, <laughs> in the production of the video, uh, a new world record was set for this category and gets it's in the end there, but um, it's really interesting. Uh, I highly recommend it. We'll have it in the show notes, but uh, uh, yeah, speed uh, running along those same lines. I think, I think I had plugged it before, but there was somebody who had done a explanation of why this one particular video was, and always will be the fastest speed run of super Mario uh, specifically because mm. the difference possible, like he by the pixel identifies how much better you could get, and that ends up being less than one frame. And so because of that, you will never see anything faster than this. And and you know that and that's a game that's been run a lot billions of times, right? Yeah. And there's so much more of that being explored as older games either get remade or emulation gets possible. There's another channel I watched a lot of uh over the week called NG Plus, and uh uh their whole thing is like can you beat this game in a certain weird way? And it's like that. They theoretically go through and can you do it? Can you not do it? How could you? Um, and a lot of it requires some breakthroughs and just playing it and breaking these games a lot. It's really, uh, it's really cool. So check it out. Uh, Brian, you got a cool. pick? Yeah, dude. Uh, I got a pick. It's a hot new cartoon from Disney called Chip and Dale's Rescue Rangers. Oh, oh man, that looks fun. Uh, oh, wait. Am I talking about the, old, the old show one? from the 1990s? No. Nope. No? I'm, t I'm, I'm <gasps> talking about, I'm talking about uh, Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers, the movie that's oh. on Disney Plus right now. Uh, 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 here's a tip. If you think it's funny that a Chip and Dale movie would open with a Tenacious D montage song, uh, then yes, you would be right. And also you might like this show. Uh, it's great. Uh, th there is a whole bunch of just cameos on cameos on cameos. And there's a little bit of like, uh, Ooh, I recognize that or whatever. The amount of legal negotiations that must've happened in the background, like Randy from South park shows up in a moment, like right now in, in, in the scene that we're seeing right now. And that's Jimmy Neutron. Uh, yep. That's Pink see, Panther. That's, that's right. That's right. That's, that's the right. Keyblade from Kingdom Hearts. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a controversy because in the lower right, you'll see a hairstyle that appears to have been traced from some fan art of Kingdom oh. Hearts. Uh, oh. looks like somebody, Try to phone it in over a weekend. Uh, doesn't matter. There's just so much there. Uh, I loved it. Uh, uh, if if uh, one of my favorite bits was seeing fan culture, the Comic Con Dragon Con experience. There, um, Ugly Sonic shows up as played by uh, uh, Tim Robinson from I Think You Should Leave. It's great. It's great. I've watched it twice. Nice. Oh wow. Uh, with that, is that in the theaters? Do you uh, have to go Disney to the Plus. Cinep Disney Plus. Sir. Oh, okay. Disney Plus. Uh, you saw who directed it? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Akiva something or other from L uh, Lonely Schaefer. Island, right? Yeah, Akiva. Yeah. Yeah. 
Wow. I'm glad to he- see they finally got, you know. <laughs> finally, <laughs> they made it. <laughs> <laughs> we knew you guys could do it. The talent was there. It was so, uh, uh, and uh, this is a significant spoiler. If you're going to watch it, don't listen to this. But uh, they spend a good 20 or 30 minutes talking about the big bad guy named uh, Sweet Pete. Sweet Pete is a uh, middle-aged Peter Pan. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's amazing and he's mm. exactly the way you would picture him mm. it's amazing oh, inter- oh, mm. i saw a screenshot of him it's so good <laughs> my pick is the movie buried i never saw this before the ryan reynolds movie this came out in like 2010 it takes place entirely inside of a coffin you ever see this no Mm-mm. 90 minute film Entirely inside of a coffin. Well, no, no, so, now, Andrew, that sounds like there would not be a lot of um, space to play. Uh, uh, I yeah, but at least you'd be with Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> yeah, got Ryan. But this is, and this is early Ryan Reynolds. This is not quippy, fun Ryan Reynolds. This is Ryan Reynolds. I'm an actor. Somebody please, somebody recognize. please cast me as the Green Lantern. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. Um, it uh. Very engaging. The single location genre is fascinating to me. Um, Lifeboat by Alfred Hitchcock, 12 Angry Men. Those are other examples of that. This is literally, when I say inside the coffin, inside the coffin. And you can like, how would this be entertaining? And I was I was very interested throughout. And so uh, kind of kind of really crazy to be able to pull that off. I would be interested to see if they've got like a making of featurette because... Like stage design is already very specific so that you can film with it, but then doing it with a fake buried coffin, I'm sure must be really uh, particular. They uh, have I'm, one I, on the video, I, 10 bucks. I'm going to, I'm going to wager that there's a fair bit of uh, crafts of uh, stagecraft where he's actually standing up mainly because faces look weird when you're laying down. And if you're going to do a whole movie of someone's face, you probably want to figure out a way well, it's, they could be Ryan standing Reynolds up. Face. It's Ryan and Reynolds' face. I mean, look at that yeah. face. That's a standing up face. He's standing up right now. I guarantee. Yeah, you'll you. see. Watch, watch the, the sand and all that. Trust me. He's yeah, if there weren't there. dirt and sand. Yeah, maybe leaning back. Maybe, maybe this. Because guess what? You like, can watch the behind the scenes, Brian. They okay. showed. Okay, okay. <laughs> they, they go into this. So, anyhow, uh, uh, that's my pick, gentlemen. Oh, Bryce. I, uh, yep. Uh, Hamilton's oh. spiral. Oh, that's right. You already said. I'm right bad. Right. I'm bad. <laughs> It's been weird. Thank you. Uh, somebody just pointed out Locke with Tom Hardy. I, I, they, I've seen a lot behind about it, but like the premise doesn't pull me in yet, but I'm curious to see it. Uh, did either of you guys see the, the dude got a st- his arm stuck in a rock movie? Oh, uh, 127. 127 hours. Oh, yeah. No, I didn't see that. It, okay. Yeah. I heard it. I heard you watch him saw his arm off. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, oh. I mean, you, you, you watched uh, Gerald's game. I did watch Chance. <laughs> that's that's uh, and they really <laughs> they do that too. Good job, Netflix. Um, okay, well we'll do a little bit of after things here in a minute. If you need to break, you're all right back. Time to go do that. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, yes, hello. Uh, but yeah, I've just uh, those these like speed run videos, man, have been uh, uh, all up in my grill. Yeah, go for it, Andrew. Um over the past weekend uh, between that one, the NG plus one, and there was someone else who, uh, they've done a lot with the, the the new, the Crash remakes, the re, uh, in, Insane Trilogy, is that what they call it? Yeah, Insane Trilogy. Uh, and uh, there's, a, there's, there's another really good one, which is from a third creator, I think. Um, there are so many people make videos now. Uh, that is, can you beat Crash 2 if every crate every box in the game is a nitro uh that one's interesting then they do it for crash three and then they do it for crash two or sorry for crash one except crash one is like actually legitimately impossible to do so they have to kind of fudge it a little bit but it's uh it's really neat still it works as i watched the speedrun doc on the hobbit game that was also weirdly fascinating and it is there's a lot of because because speedruns generally especially in modern times um have to have video proof um then you, know, you generally have all of the material at your fingertips to say this is this is you know uh, i mean there's even counters on everything you could okay this is where they started saving time this is where they started saving time um 
and and so I think it's interesting, and I like the like the the Spire one that I talked about because they integrate graphics and they do a really good job of trying to make it look visually interesting as well as tell the story. Because sometimes you can also just get the like Wikipedia early life version of the story, right? Just like in 2009, the world record was broken by XX Gamer X. Uh, and then in 2009, the record was broken again by John Gamer. And then in 2009, the record was broken by Alexander Gamer from the Gamer family. And, you know, it's just like a lot of the, this and this and this. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of really good stuff out there. You probably Some people have probably seen the Veritasium video about um, uh, uh, cosmic... Uh, cosmic glitches, cosmic radiation causing glitches in old hardware. Um, and uh, I thought that's what Brian was going to mention during the, six, the Mario 64 thing, is that uh, they they figured out that a skip that had been captured was because of one of those completely random uh, radiation glitches. And uh, then they could, and then once they thought it was that, then they were able to find a way to replicate it in software. Um what the bit flipping that the you know the, the radiation actually did so uh you know there's a lot of interesting stories out there and on my like i on newer newer games like uh i just well, i saw one that was like dark souls can you beat all the bosses on dark souls alphabetically <laughs> <laughs> which is really interesting can you could you what do you have to do um it's pretty great yeah Anybody watched uh, Star Trek Strange New Worlds? Uh, no, that's on my list, though. We're told now, it's great. Now that I've I've made, made it through I, Picard. I, imagine, I gotta, I'm got i going to pitch you a Star Trek ser- premise for a Star Trek show, okay? Yeah, yeah. Imagine a Star Trek series where every episode was kind of self-contained. There are some storylines that went through to other episodes, but really each one you got a conflict mm-hmm. and then dealing with it and then a resolution. Yeah, but I'd prefer it be in a setting where, like, anything was possible. They were exploring strange new worlds, and you never knew what was going to happen next. And there was no, uh, like, Brian, deep I got lore. news for you. That's what this show is. What? <laughs> like, crazy. A Star Trek about people, like, like not a telling a novella set in space with... I mean, the science is still really... There is still the, the dumbest part of Star Trek. It is still dumb. Let me make that very clear. It is literally a... Uh, a, no, I, I I am super excited to give it a try. It is it is a we have one episode where let's say they have to use some genetic modification to disguise themselves as aliens, and then the plot line of the next episode is how the Federation's is outlined genetic modification. You're like, wait, did did didn't you just do that to do but that was different. It was like <sighs> Sci, but still better, way better than Discovery. Is. More like Picard, sci I couldn't finish. fiction. <sighs> yeah, I like Picard okay, season I one. I enjoyed it. Picard <laughs> season two. Oh my god. Uh, weirdly, I like season two better than one because it didn't pretend to be anything other than a dance party remix. Did, did you finish season two? I did. I did. It was this. Oh wow. It was a dance party remix of everything. Like I wouldn't be surprised if Picard woke up and just said, "I had the craziest dream." You were there. I'll try you to were finish there. it. Cause like I'm like we're in the whole car chase illegal immigrant storyline. <laughs> yeah, that, like, that was where it was the worst. Uh it, but, I'm like, this feels like a nineteen nineties TV show. This yeah. is not in a good way. <laughs> uh uh, do we have a specific topic? Otherwise I've I've got something. Uh, I think we could do an update. Bryce has an update on League of Marbles. Uh I have mm. an observation and well let's do in with you your stuff and cool. We'll do it. Nice. We'll round up. Ready. Well, uh, I am ready to go. You ready to go, Andrew? I'm ready. Then I'll count you in. In three, two. Hello, and welcome to the After Things podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, hello. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hello, hello. Hey, man. Hi. Isn't this the show where we talk about how to make it as an independent creative? Which among us is doing anything independent and or creative? <sighs> None of us. <laughs> Roll credits. Diamond Club hopes you've enjoyed this program. <laughs> I don't know. We, we've all uh, got Bryce. updates, it sounds like, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Let's talk about marbles, Bryce. Yeah. So we, uh, uh, I, I, we, we started marbles back up on Friday, uh, season three, week one, and uh, it was it was a blast, um, like it always is. Um, uh, a couple of things that were new um, in uh, that we started with is uh, I started up a Patreon for marbles. So. Uh... In this case, uh, 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 one of the things we always advise, uh, I, I, I was talking to somebody who was hmm. thinking about going independent, and this person said, yeah, I don't know, maybe I'll launch a Patreon to gauge interest. And I was just like, <laughs> what, 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 stop, no, 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 you do not harvest before you plant, sir. And he was like, what, what are you even saying? I was like, ah, oh. and so 17 metaphors later, I think he understood. <laughs> yeah. There is the... My one rule, and this is a thing, don't be a flake. A flake's like, we'll do it if you want it. I'll write the book if you guys will buy mm -hmm. the book. Like, you know, yeah. I will, I will, I'll put, I'm only going to put in the effort after you put in your hard earned money or commit promise to me. It's like that, that, that's in a world where we're not inundated with other opportunities of things that are finished products. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Um, and like, and uh, I'll show my hand. Like I wanted to get this started months ago, <laughs> and like I've been in a, a weird head space, and we've been busy with doing different things. So um, at some point, I was just like, I just need to do it. I, I've told everybody that when I decide to do it, it'll be on short notice. I email, I send out an email like less than twenty four hours before the stream. That Patreon that I made, I I turned it on like less than forty eight hours before that stream. Like it was really just like I just need to get started and get doing it because when when we did the stream the stream was great and it was a lot of fun and uh we have a pretty good amount of support on the patreon uh, so so um oh man i can't believe how similar our, our tales are um so uh, it it was a case where you knew you needed to flip the switch for a very long time and then and then something caused you to just was, go for it yeah i knew it would be on a friday and i didn't i I, there, there, I ran out of excuses for what it would have been this Friday because I wanted to do it like right after Founders Day, um, which was like two months ago now. But I just it, it, it just got tough to do. And so I was really glad that I could kind of just roll into it and that we had a lot of people turn out. We had almost 100 people turn out, which is good. Um, uh, a, a lot of people kept playing, which is a big thing. You know, we get to see how many people enter every race and it was still nice and high. It was over 80 people. Uh, pretty much the whole day, I think. Are, are are you comfortable sharing some numbers with us, or? Sure. I mean, we can go to the Patreon and, and at least start from there. Um, so uh, I, uh, I I started the Patreon, patreoncom slash LFGX, and uh, we are at hundred and eleven dollars a month, um, which was uh, uh, a lot during the stream. We we do have a we do have a fifty dollar level that is like, hey, uh, you'll be a title sponsor so i'll say your name during right. one of the streams per month is, is is that the kind of thing where like um uh I, I don't know if you're just downloading uh existing maps or designing maps or whatever but could you have like an arena named after you or something um so so i can't do that in the game but but that person kind of sponsors the stream so they it's it's the the, the marbles dot win week two match. So 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 maybe it could be like a let uh, let's say I had you know I don't know fifty hundred dollars however whatever the imaginary number is mm -hmm. burning a hole in my pocket and I was like you know what I want there to be a championship cup named after me and it's like uh, I, I, I compete for the the brushwood cup uh, is is there a mm. tier that would let me do that? Um, uh, there so. That's the look that says there will be now. That, I mean, and, <laughs> and, and, and I'm like, I'm gonna price. We're gonna, you're, we're gonna, you're gonna get brutalized here, man. I want to contribute to this Patreon. Okay, Google search League of Fun Games. Mm -hmm. Oh, marbles dot win. Where do I click? And I know that it's not linked on the website right now. And also, like that did not really stop people from tuning in. Like. I got almost every patron came while I was streaming and saying the URL. And so you could have one more right now. I just need to know. <laughs> well, well, but, but, but and but like I know. Is my money no good here? No, just tell me. In, in Bryce's defense, uh, uh, Bryce and I had a very similar parallel experience over the last five days. And uh, going zero to anything is is the bigger yeah. jump. 
like, and, like and, oh yeah, be- better to launch and then have things to fix than never to have launched. Exactly. You know, like for me, the the big win was that I got a, a good URL that I was happy with um, because. At first, I was like, well, you know, I want to use Patreon because uh, a lot of our fans already use Patreon. Um, but League of Fun Games is so long. LFG is already taken. I'm, uh, it was already taken. How do I abbreviate it but not uh, make it only tied to marbles forever? How do I do whatever? So uh, just on, like, the Patreon page, I was just typing around, and that's where I came up with uh, or where I f- figured it. I found the X key. And so instead of instead of plus, it's LFG X because it it when plus is not enough, it, you multiply. Well, and and also X is you know that that perfectly neutral. It means extreme kind of thing, right? So just LFG X. Yeah. And and it also implies um, versus competition, excitement. Yeah. Yeah. And and so uh, the so the, so we talked about the title sponsor one that's fifty dollars a month and then there's a three dollar and a six dollar a month and I was I, I was kind of noodling on this for a little bit because I wasn't quite sure it the pricing is so important on these right um, because I knew I wanted to do it monthly because I didn't want to get into weeks and matches and I didn't want to get too much into that weeds you you, you um, don't want it to be a job for either you or them right. Right. I want it to, like, uh, I think about Twitch. Like, so much of this game is built around using Twitch and when we stream live on Twitch. And when you subscribe to Night Attack on Twitch, you get things. You get skins. You get your name looks different in the game. You, you get things from it. And so I knew that I would have to be, I, I couldn't compete with that. I can't, like, roll my own part of that into the game. There's just, there fundamentally is not a way to do that with the tech. So how do I, how do I give people... A, a way to support the the thing if they just would give me a would would you give me a buck during the stream and I can say that that is the three dollar level because we'll do about three streams a, a month or so and then how do I ask people to get a little bit more and how do I what benefits can I give them and how much could I charge for that and the 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 big tentpole is I can give you the archives I it, it, Twitch doesn't keep them forever I can keep them forever I keep the music stripped out of them that will grow every week. We can do, I want to do like cuts and like race in 30 type things, try to do experimental ideas. And so that's the $6 where that's, a, that's something, something. Um, uh, but it's also not like a whole Netflix. Uh, Does that, I mean, is that like, it's probably, it's probably low, probably. No, 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 no. But I, that I, is I, I'm, I'm trying to think of other things that, that I would want. So, so, because I wanted, I want to keep like I really like how uh, our friend Mikey Newman does the Film Joy Patreon. They have right. three tiers. It's dead simple, small, medium, large. Right. And so that's what I want to really hone in on is how do I make it easy to pick a level, pick a number, and then how do I give you give give out things as easy as possible. Uh. So one thing, and I'm just spitballing here, sure. but but um. Whoa. Uh, you you can always expand what the experience is. Yeah. And one way to expand the thing is like, do you do acceptance speeches from the winners? Um. Uh, it, that is that has been an idea that's been floated, and uh, we could do, but that makes the show slower. Well, uh, and so that's so, the only. So, thing. so so imagine imagine the race ends, mm-hmm. and you announce the winner. And by virtue of winning, you get to record up to 30, 45 seconds or whatever of an acceptance speech. That is free by virtue of right of winning. But if you contribute at a certain level, you get to give a response. And so you mm. get to record. So you so you either win the right to talk about how great you are, or you get if somebody wants to play the heel in in this sports league and be all like, oh, uh, pay to just play a message. That's right. They pay, and in mm. exchange, they get to record and put it, and you will animate a little marble jumping up and down on a platform uh, for them. I see. And then and then you will play it like, well, here's the reigning champion, ah, but there's a contender who has something to say. Uh. What's this? Another contender has something to say. Three whole contenders? 
that's yeah. 150 bucks I just made. <laughs> oh my God, that's two whole minutes of the content. Well, yeah. let's see who wins. Well, and then you, you know what's interesting is we do have something similar to that uh, right now. So Twitch has channel points. Have you seen these? When you watch when you watch someone, you get a little bean. You get beans. They give you a little token for watching a, a channel. And so like we have one here on Night Attack. Um, uh, and so, uh, we have a little thing where if you spend a certain number of your tokens, you can type any message and I'll just read the message and it's a note from my producer. And so like, uh, that type of interaction is the type of thing that I do, uh, like doing because that, that is the big product here is the live show. And, and, and also like watching the live show, I would, I, uh, I think it would become addictive for me to pay just a dollar to cause you to read a single line of sponsorships like this just mm -hmm. in from our sponsor uh mr second place guy is is a total d-bag uh, yeah brought to you by kellogg's <laughs> you know yeah. like like it would be funny for you to read it i would mm -hmm. feel fun it would be fun for me to pay a dollar to do that uh i would totally. say yeah and so well and that gets i mean that specific idea gets into a logistical thing, right? Like, uh, totally, we can do that now with Twitch. Um, uh, you know, they, 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 there are things like that, and all of that goes into tw hooks into Twitch. So then suddenly we get it. Then where, 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 what's going where? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's I, I, yeah, I that would be cool because I like that, like the wrestling element of it. We were talking in the stream. Of like, okay, could we do like a drive to survive thing, and uh, where you know we have a fictional storyline and fake racers and stuff like that, I, and all of that stuff I want to build into more. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah, like well, I, if, yeah, if, that's that's if, the whole if, if point. Your is to spend concern my time. is uh, how how do uh, magical beans going into the night attack account eventually become real dollars in the price account we can figure that out because because <laughs> yeah. you're right i mean there's an ecosystem and that would be the easiest way to do it but yeah. but but let's let's but, let's talk about that yeah. because i think that would be really really fun and the idea of of smack talk uh, uh between players for a nonsense game anyway like really what you're doing is you're allowing the players of the game to become the story engine that drives the game exactly. and paying you the entire time to just be <laughs> caught in the middle uh, like oh i'm just a fair adjudicator here what can i do yeah yeah and and i love all of that stuff like i i yeah i, I want to figure out more, more stuff okay right, so that's right. that, that that's a little bit update on on marvels i uh, uh i'm really looking forward to it and i'm really glad that uh uh everyone seemed to be responding very positively to the value proposition. Cause so, I was really worried of like six dollars, six dollars. I think it's a good price. Cause it's like, it's, I like Bryce. I'll, I'll get Bryce six bucks a month. I'd, I'd buy Bryce. I mean, also it's like, you know, if I played, uh, if I played the, the mid tier happy meal, <laughs> I mean, if I played, a, if I played 45 minutes of dance, dance revolution once a month, it's going to be more than six dollars, <laughs> right? you know? Yeah. Um, and, 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 yeah, that's my whole. That was my whole feeling. Was like, I won't. I need to make because I. Th I think about it. I think in terms of this a lot. Like, uh, like I have to use a delivery service at my apartment. They make me, and I think I have to pay more than Netflix every month for this awful service, um, and that's that's the barometer for me. It used to be like, okay, Kickstarters and stuff. I don't know, thirty bucks is enough to spend on something where it's not crazy. But you have people comparing it to how much they're paying for Disney and Netflix and all of the other stuff. So <laughs> we're uh, paying for Netflix. Uh, well, well, and, and, <laughs> and, and, but but also it's uh, it's very easy to pivot to apples and oranges and say, uh, yeah, last time I checked, Disney won't say your name live on the stream. So oh no, last I checked, Brian, they will say your name and your daughter's name. <laughs> okay, all right. Last time I checked, how many people I have say done my this? name? <laughs> <laughs> fair enough fair enough <laughs> for those of you know brian and his daughter actually appear on disney plus that's right i, I mean, wonder uh, uh uh yeah boy what a what a what a wonderful turn of events that was uh, uh mm -hmm. we, we've talked about it before but you know we we had to shut down the normal way we did things for scam nation uh scam school before it and and uh, none of us knew if what we were doing was worth anything. And now, now 
my daughter is the thumbnail for that channel, and it's pretty <laughs> rad. <laughs> so I... you, you, you never know which of your scratch-off lottery tickets are going to pay off, is, totally. my, is my point. I, I would say that of the people, of my friends when the pandemic started, started, who sort of dug in and just said, let me just get to work and figure things out, maybe all of them have prospered in some way. Maybe not all financially, but they the 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 efforts have shown themselves, have manifested themselves in different ways, and led to stuff. Yeah, I mean, we uh, uh, on on Great Night a few a few months back, uh, Gus, you know, he started that a, a trivia stream, um, because partly because of the pandemic to kind of fill the HQ trivia void from a few years ago. Yeah, HQ trivia vanished, and around that time, Gus couldn't tour with a live show. Uh, and HQ was a few years before that, even. I think. Uh, oh, sure, sure, pretty, sure. Yeah, but yeah. But 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 nobody was stepping in on that void, and and meanwhile, uh, even found... today, in a quote unquote back to work world, um, if if you are a Fortune 500 company, I I don't think I'm talking out of school because I'm speculating. Uh, but if you're a Fortune 500 company and you have a Thursday meeting every Thursday once a month, it's worth the. Again, making up numbers, I don't know, yeah. three to five thousand dollars to pay for somebody to show up doing a live uh, 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 trivia stream. I mean, it's 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 an incredible opportunity, and I don't think it's going away no. anytime soon. And and you know, it, 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 he was using just saw like it, it wasn't even like he went out and built a whole thing. It's, he was using a thing that was already out there uh, and, and to and, great effect. And also, the thing that was already out there, they were like. Hey, it looks like you're using this thing on 300 accounts. <laughs> and he says, yes, we make a new account for every university that hires me. And they're all like, yeah, that's not what it's for. And <laughs> to his credit, he didn't say, "What, uh, whatever, let's fight. He said, okay, how do we work this out? And then they worked it out. Yeah. And now he's like a premier client of theirs. You yeah. Know? And they've got a whole, you know, it's, it's. It's it's very cool. Like we the the we've become very inventive um, in in uh, this this new era. So, so t uh, tell me this: when mm. when it came to that moment when you realized that there was just no more excuses and it was time to just do the thing, mm. um, did you feel a tremendous amount of anxiety? Uh, uh hmm. That's a very good question because I think it was the anxiety that was holding me. It was keeping me from getting started um, because once I started it, you know, just getting like I would, I would have to do this thing because I was procrastinating a little bit. I had to do this thing where I would turn my desktop computer on and I would open up a Chrome window to the YouTube page to make a new YouTube channel. And I was like, okay. The next time I walk by this, I'm going to see this and I'm going to do it because I know it'll just take a second. And it, it's, I, that's what it was. It was it was more being uh, the, the thing I was afraid of was everyone was being tarred and feathered for being too greedy or for making the wrong value proposition. Uh, I, I yeah. do that a lot. I'll just open up a window. I'll put a title on a thing. I'll start a note and I'll just put a thing there. Mm -hmm. Man, things fill themselves out. Don't know how it happens, but just saying, oh, yeah, I'm just going to create the document. Not going to sit down and do it. Too busy, but I'll create the document and keep this open. And then a little here, a little there, then. Yeah. Uh, I finally crossed the threshold after all my talk about, you know, whether it would be in the form of writing a book or a series of instructional videos or mm, uh, a live dance. stream or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, it finally, I ran out of excuses because I sent out an email saying I want to do a class where I teach everything I know about stuff. And I ended up, I have an email list of 171 people who have gone through the very difficult task of being on my email list, reading the email that I sent out saying I want to do a class, uh, going to the website selecting the item for zero dollars sign me up for the wait list so they had to mock buy the product beforehand uh and then finally it was like okay well we got to pick a date 171 people i can't do that many people uh all i need is 10 people if we can get 10 people physically here i could give a very good two-day class with a friday get together and um uh it was terrifying because 
it's like I have to start. And and I wrote and had to suffer through my wife saying, this was a bad email. You need to rewrite it. Mm. Uh, and then wrote it again and sent it out on Saturday. And then on Sunday, uh, I was like, okay, there are three people signed up. Um, and so I will write another email. And every email will be a gift, a piece of the story I want to tell, a segment, uh, uh, essentially a miniature chapter, mm -hmm. and a reminder to sign up for the class. And then yesterday, I wrote another email. And then today, I wrote another email. And every day, it gets a little bit easier, and every day, another person signs up for the class. And I realized, oh, oh my God, I'm doing this because there's a deadline, and I'm afraid and I don't want to do the class for fewer than 10 people. And as a result of having this deadline, I am forcing myself out of fear to write chapter by chapter. If I do this for 100 days, I'll have multiple books that, that, that will exist. Um, mm. So uh, anyway, uh, I'm teaching a class about everything I know about brand, branding, about uh, developing multiple verticals. Um, it's the same stuff. We've talked about a lot in after things. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to find it, get on the wait list. Just go to scamstuff.com. Search everything is probably the best word because I uh, uh, what I haven't figured out is a good name for the class or identity for the tribe because the goal is we're going to spend two days together. It's going to be a very small group. We're all going to learn what everybody's working on, and then there'll be some clubhouse. I don't know if it'll be a discord or uh, email listserv or whatever yeah. but um it's um it's i i felt this kind of fear about getting started maybe in 15 20 years and you guys know this comes from a place because this is precious to me and uh it took me a long time to figure out the reason that i have held off on doing it is because um, partly because I don't want to be known as an advice guru. I just want to give advice. Um, and uh, more importantly, I don't want to be somebody who gets high on their own supply. I don't want to need the money for the class. And uh, uh, I ran the numbers and it was really only real after realizing that if, if I wanted to be quiet, uh, I could retire today. Uh, and for some reason, that made it okay for me to charge money to give advice. And I don't know, that that's all head work that I'm going through. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, uh, I know that the first class is uh, uh, one month from now, uh, on the 25th and 26th. Oh. And, and, that, and we're half full, and I'm just going to keep writing these emails, and hopefully we'll fill up, and then there'll be another class after that, and on and on and on. I like that that structure, the setup you've got of like of having a general wait list and then, uh, you know, set, uh, reaching out specifically to just those people. Hey, this is a day. Can you it, do this? Day? Is, like, I kind of like that. I, that's very specific. It, I like it, that. it is so liberating because I get to say things that I'd be terrified to say to the general list. The, the, the main list is 120,000 people large. And most of them really just want to hear, what's your cool trick or what's your latest video, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Very few of them want to hear the difference between this brand versus that brand or how to build value and, you know, whatever. But, but this very, very small group, I really do feel like I get to speak as honestly and plainly as I do on this show and as we do on phone calls. And, um, it was very, very hard on Saturday. It was less hard on Sunday, less hard yesterday. Uh, or, and then and today, it started to feel good. And I was like, I'm stoked about it. And uh, it, it lets me feel like however many people signed up, it'll be earned. Because um, it, most people don't know me as somebody who competently uh, can offer advice about being an independent creative. That's not 
true at all. Well, I, it, it is um, not among this circle. It is not yeah, your okay. public brand Correct. that you are Correct. a business guy. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, you are okay, gotcha. uh, the magic science. It is number seven or eight podcast. in in the list. Of no, things I meant even you, internally, but... we don't think you can give <laughs> advice. Uh, but, but you can, you you gather my meaning though, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> I yes, and I would say that. Anybody who does anything competently to the person who does not looks like this person probably would be capable of doing something like this. I think you, the the challenge you face right now is uh, there's a huge audience that wants this and some people are beginning to recognize this. I think that as you this is your first iteration of it and you need to keep it you need to iterate on this as quickly as possible because the moment the moment the moment the 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 seats are still warm from people leaving this one is to sit down and say okay what do i do for round two and how do i how do i iterate like how did you know i'm gonna you know, let's use name names people really good at this tony robbins sure sure tony and tony robbins went from he he went from like it was at the diamonds who had their 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 nutrition seminars that he helped with he learned how to do their thing he took that he kind of that became his gimmick and then he got into his whole created his own he followed the gimmick and this is not what you're doing but he followed this and he also then he learned oh i can scale up and i can go reach i can actually be a ceo coach i can do these wealth mastery classes he realized there's an entire tier of people who are professionals who have a lot of disposable income that are still looking for somebody to be a guru guru or help them understand how to do stuff and it came from just iterating and iterating and iterating and i think that uh for you now that yeah now that now it's come easy for you it's like man there's somebody out there whose life you're going to there are a lot of people out there whose life you're going to change they just need to know that you offer it yes and uh that's part of why I'm excited to keep it small at first so that I can refine, you know, like a, like a, you know, a quartz in a rock tumbler, you know, it just, it, mm-hmm. it, you know how it goes with flight time with magic. It's like, uh, uh, you, you could practice in front of a mirror all you want, but it's different when you get up on stage and you realize, Oh wait, no, I need to factor in this, that, I, and the other thing. Yeah. I don't, the product, like I don't, I have zero doubts or words or is about the product. My my concern is your nervousness or anxiety or your insecurity about oh should I be selling this hindering your ability to really build well, this and, into the and, business. And it I suppose be. that's the exciting news is that we've crossed that threshold and now uh, I've committed to a date. We're already half full and now awesome. it's awesome. just a matter of of uh, 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 every, every email I send out yeah. um, uh, contains a gift. Uh, of of a little piece of wisdom, uh, so that every every time somebody sees it, they're like, "Oh, Brian's going to tell me something I hadn't thought of before." And then and then also it'll be a reminder to get in the class. And um, uh, yeah, so so now that we're over the hump, it's a matter of of just refining and going. Uh, but yeah, I'm very excited about it. I would, if I would suggest, I would think now think of it as a product and the idea of the page like you don't i don't need the email to tell me i want to go to a page and see like ah oh, in this session we're going to talk about this and bullet points in this session this and bullet points and 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 uh that's part of the glory of of having a small email list because i think the bulk of what i'm writing right now will show up as all the individual components sweet um and uh uh, uh on top of that like you ever catch yourself doing those moments where you're like Oh, apparently I am serious about this. For me, that moment was uh, gussying up my LinkedIn page. Oh wow! <laughs> That's that was the moment I That's realized real. that I was serious about this. <laughs> I'm I'm so proud of you, Brian. I am. I well, am, thank you. I, I mean, not just that, but I'm in general. I, I I. It's easier for us to sit here and tell other people, "Oh, you should go do this. You should do this." But when it comes to us making that leap, when Brian Bryce with you and you know. Next step with League of Marvels. I mean, that's all the League of Fun Games. Sorry, yeah, don't sue uh, lawyer. Yeah, uh, I, 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 are, are you comfortable with like updating the logo with LFGX? Like, uh, like, like, like that way it's a unified brand. There, I do want to make a fun, goofy because it really it was going to be LFG Plus and it was going to be entirely ironic. 
but then the X was available. And it was X really is cool. fun. It's okay, so good. Uh, so I do. I am gonna make a fun little X thing. If if I may, uh, <laughs> if you go into LFGX and act like that's always been the current thing, and then whenever you talk about LFG, it's as though you're talking about 1970s ABC's <laughs> Wide World of Sports. You know, <laughs> like the, the like models the, race up in the app yeah. and the funnel. Black and, and white filters <laughs> and film grain and stuff. Dun, 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 dun. That's that's in my head. That was ragtime piano. I hope that. Uh, no, da, 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 it was, dra- da, 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 it was da, da, dramatic. Uh, it was pain. <laughs> that train was about to pull into a, a train. station. I tell you what. <laughs> uh, Andrew, do you have an update? What's what, what's going on with you? How are you doing? You know, uh, I had that. I did the talk about speed reading on weird things last week, oh, yeah. and uh, I got some feedback from some people who try and experiment with that. And I encourage anybody else who wants to try it. I've been doing a lot of like reading. One on my Kindle, like one word at a time, just really, really fast paced, just mm. just to train the brain to do that. And so now I'm working on a plug in because like I I built a system where I, I my anecdotal research has shown that um, using two words, like two words at a time, like the cat is allows you to go faster than just going the and then cat because certain phrases your eyes just pick up right away and your brain gets it so for, i'm building i've been building what i want to be the fastest most efficient speed reading system out there wow um and so to first step was i said let me find a bunch of what are the most common two word pairs so i took a corpus of millions of millions of words of text and i actually created a list of ten thousand two word pairs and then common words <laughs> Can, 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 can we take just a moment to appreciate the raw ambition embodied in the three of us? Like, he was like, like, I don't know. I'm going to make a, I'm going to invent a sport out of virtual marble. <laughs> I'm going to make a new speed I'm reading make it app. A network. I don't know. I'm just going to become a guru of brand development. I don't know. I'm just going to fix reading. <laughs> but, and, and. It'll be PayPal for words. I, in each of our case, yeah. I would say that we're we are probably underestimating things enough, but we've had enough experience doing things, and also we're pretty good at sort of surveying. I've looked at the landscape of like speed reading apps, and I've realized, oh, a lot of these are based on ideas and not theory and research. And so I've been doing this dive into the research, and I've got research paper after research paper looking at things, and then and then then just doing this sort of ad hoc. Hey, you over there, try this. You go try this, and tell me. And I'm like. Huh, I'm getting really good signal here. I need to be able to, I need to, you know, part of why I'm doing this because I want to build some tools to test it. But I'm like, it's not like I became at, I was one of the youngest illusion designers in the world. Why? Because every other 20 year old had better things to do. Self deprecation of side, um, you know, it's uh, uh, because nobody told you not to. You know, I, right. I, I sometimes marvel at the audacity. Uh, that that you and I share of like nobody gave us permission to tour everywhere doing magic. No. We just did it. That's so yeah, weird. We don't, we don't. Yeah, I mean that's part of it. It's like I tell people, don't ask for permission, just do it. And and this is a case where I don't think enough people. It's not like there are people. There are researchers who've done a lot in this sort of area, but they're not. Their goal is research. They're not actually trying to create physical things in the world that they can scale and get feedback cycles. I have a whole theory on how you can, if you merge the two, you get way more data. But like, it's not like it's, it's not like I'm, you know, I work for a company that's building these incredibly advanced AI language models. It's not like I'm like, I'm just throwing my hat in that ring. Like, oh no, I'm going to build my own. Like, no, that's, that's, that's a problem. It's way, way more complex than I understand. Although I have ideas. Um, this is like, oh, well, to build the best speed reading app, you need to figure out one, one word, two words, phrases. There's a simple set of questions you need to be asked to build things, then test it, and you get data back, and then you can have. To me, it's like, oh, I understand the scope of the problem. So, hmm. I mean, it is. It not is not cancer. You you are basically describing a science experiment that you could monetize. It well, and I don't. So, my I mean, goal, I mean like, that's that's yeah. very reductionist. It is but a the, the way it, yeah, you're, it is. I, you're getting data is, back, and yeah, I am going to open source this. I've already got my algorithms, things like this. It's going to be on GitHub. Anybody who wants to build it right now, I'm working on a on a of a bookmarklet. You just put into your thing, and on any website, you'll be able to speed read it. I just want to put it out there because I think if people get used to it, I have really cool things you could do with it later on using language models and stuff. But yeah, I mean that's been that's sort of my pet project on the side is. If I can, if I could make something that could help people read 10, 15% faster. That'd be valuable. 
That'd be helpful. You know, yeah. that'd be cool. I mean, uh, not for nothing, but that is literally the kind of thing that can alter the shape of humanity should it take off and you get it right. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. There are a few ifs there. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah. But, 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 but still, yeah. those are the kind of ifs that get you up and excited first thing in the morning to keep on yeah. working on it. Yeah, I mean, that's I've gone on through so many projects. What I like about this is that, like, oh, I know, what's the business? There is none. I just build some tools, give them to people, let anybody build on top of it. That's it. That's it. If, if I can prove that this, 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 this algorithm is more efficient, which should be pretty easy to determine, then cool. If not, hey, that was fun. Nice. Oh. There we go. I think we did it. I think we solved the world. We did it. You're welcome. Fixed. Yeah. Uh, oh, what I did not mention before when we were talking, somebody's brought in, uh, Cliff Singer brought up, I listen to podcasts at two and a half speed and wish you guys would talk faster and watch it live, um, <laughs> is there was, I think I mentioned there was some Microsoft research into people who were blind and using two audio speakers and they caught, created the cocktail party effect to try to increase the speech speed a later on project that i want to do is i've been reading the research on understanding which do we understand better at high speeds what kind of voices and and lower pitch lower pitch voices seem to work better at high speeds because they kind of speed up like higher pitched and if you listen to like audible they do some kind of little magic to sort of make it work better at high speed i i'm looking into the idea of training an artificial voice that works really well at very high speeds wow hmm. Oh, interesting. So it would, uh, it could listen to audio and then re say well, it. Well, you just, or, you just turn the it. text. The text would get converted into audio at like you know four X. I, I I wonder if at the very highest speeds there might not be some opportunity for like content aware, context awareness, where it knows to repeat phrases that that aren't repeated in the original text. So the thing that I want to get to with the reading thing is. Uh, you know, my day job, I work with these really powerful language models that can do amazing tasks like summarizing, extracting key points, rephrasing, whatever, is that first step one is increase the rate at which we read. Second is to use, like what you pointed, Brian, like you say, is like, I've got an algorithm that tries to, I basically, I look for common words. If it's not a common word, I slow it, I, I, I let it linger longer. With a language model, you could. I want to do things that give you, for nonfiction, a TLDR at the top and bullet points you need to hit and say, these are the key phrases you need to know, da-da-da-da-da. Then get to the end and say, this is what you learned. But like to your point, it's like, could you use it to rewrite? Because some things read easier than others. That is shockingly close to how I have started to write sales emails, where it's like the first line is always, this is an email where I'm going to tell you a joke. Mm. I'm going to curse a lot. I'm going to mix some metaphors. Then I'm going to remind you to sign up for the class. Know this guy? What about this thing? Watch this video. Every document I write for OpenAI starts with a TLDR. Yeah. Every document, because that's how I know. Yeah. I do the TLDR first, this, 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 and this. One, because people often, they scan it. Is Do they need to know what's in it? Two, for me... You know, I work with people who were working on research. We have the amount of data that we have to handle. Everybody has to handle. It's huge. And so to make sure my writing is concise, I'm doing what you do. As I just say, this is what's in here. The uh, uh, you, the, the email I wrote yesterday, uh, Bonnie says, this is way too much. Um, and that's something else that I didn't want to do, but I started doing, is is running the emails past other humans who who – just say this is where I tuned out. Like I, I've I, in two me emails, I've made it less than halfway through the first draft of that first email, and instead, just every day, just another chunk of it. Mm. Uh, when I write emails for Marvels, they're usually they're usually a little more uh, utility, right? It's like, hey, we're going to be racing tonight, uh, and so there's a good amount that gets used a lot. But the other thing that I do um, is I'll just bold. The important thing in the paragraph, just Friday, 9 p.m. Eastern, uh, yep, yep. you know, uh, the, the the point. And then, you know, I'll give that gives me that that makes me feel like it gives me space to not worry about, you know, make sure writings I'm writing something good, but not frank, not worry too, too much about it. So long as the thing I need to get across is right there in bold and they're going to see it. I um, write short paragraphs. I write two or three sentence paragraphs. I keep it very concise. You headers. Know, a style. Headers also help yeah. if you have a yep. lot of Bold different headers. So, yeah. Yep, because it's just all these are framing. Mean, a lot of I'm gonna write this dense thing. That's great. If somebody's inside your head. They're not. You know, some people will get inside your head. It'd be great, but most people like, you know, 
you're competing with everything else. Yeah. Gentlemen, it's been after. Cool. Hey, good stuff, everybody. Good job, team. All right, I got to run. All right. Got a job. Bye. Later. Goodbye, everybody. We will be back in a few hours with cord killers. Gonna okay, be... We're going to kill the cords. We'll be killing the cords. Those cords are dead. Go die. Cords. Bye, everybody.